I'm Cameron Tonkinwise, uh, and this is the Surface Design Show, and this is episode number 198. Today, we welcome Cameron Tonkinwise on the show. As a highly respected educator, Cameron has been shaping the service design field for over the last 20 years. And today, he says it's time to stop. It's time to stop eroding expert services for the sake of lowering costs and increasing revenue. Why? Because the desire to replace human knowledge and expertise with yet another chatbot is just unsustainable. It's doing more harm than good for customers and businesses in the long run. So what's the alternative? Well, Cameron makes a case that we need to start rebuilding supportive services and the economies around them. Don't worry, we'll get into details of what expert and supportive services mean later in the conversation. For now, you just need to know that supportive services recognize and value the wisdom that's embedded in lived experiences. There's just one small problem. Our clients aren't asking us to rebuild supportive services. As we just said, clients mainly ask us to do the exact opposite. All the human elements are being removed from our services and they are being increasingly automated and digitized. Of course, with the hopes to increase efficiency and gain short-term benefits. So how do we break this cycle? We need to show that there is an alternative future and that it's a better one for all of us. What that alternative future is and how do we communicate it in a compelling way that's what we're about to find out because in the upcoming chat cameron goes in depth into what exactly expert services are being eroded and what the painful consequences are of this development how we can bring back the appreciation for lived experiences into service delivery and show that it pays off and which tools we have at our disposal to give our clients the confidence to move into this direction. During the conversation, Cameron shared a great story about how a bank suddenly realized that it's not just in the business of storing our money, but also needs to be in the business of helping people relocate. As you'll hear, this surprising insight at the bank was triggered by an unfortunate disaster. The big question is whether we can also unlock these insights proactively. It is very practical yet thought-provoking story and I think that you'll enjoy it. So let's turn the volume up a bit, give our full attention to Cameron Tonkinwise and I'll catch you at the end for the closing reflections. My name is Mark Fontaine, and you are listening to the Service Design Show. Welcome to the show, Cameron. Hi, Mark. Nice to have you on. Uh, you've been on my list for quite a while. Uh, that's that's exciting. Thanks. I'm I'm honoured to be chatting to you today. It's um it's it's a great podcast. I think very necessary. Uh, I think our community needs more chat, more critique, more conversation, more maturing. That's uh, what we're trying to contribute here. Uh, and that's what we're going to try to do here as well today in our conversation. Cameron, for uh, the people who don't know who you are and your career has uh, been ever evolving, could you give us uh, an insight into uh, where you are today? What are you doing? I'm currently speaking to you from Sydney, Australia, which is Gadigal land, the land of the Gadigal language group, um, the indigenous population who never ceded. This land uh, always will, always will uh, be, always is, always will be Aboriginal land. Um, I am currently the Professor of Design Studies at the University of Technology, Sydney. I've had the great privilege of being in North America, teaching at two institutions uh, sort of five years ago for 10 years. I was at Parsons in New York City and I was at Carnegie Mellon University before that. But I've, I've always been an academic. I... Um, I worked for a sort of independent think tank called the Eco Design Foundation in the 1990s. But uh, ever since then, I've, I've been in formal university employment. But a lot of the work that I do is service design research, and we don't do that academically. We do that in an applied manner. So I do 
somewhat practice as a service designer when we're doing research projects. Mm. Carnegie Mellon, uh, Parsons, classic schools uh, for service design, for sure. Um, Cameron, uh, you have a long history with service design. And the other question that we always ask here is, do you know the first time you sort of learned about service design? Do you have, do you have a memory of that? I have a distinct memory of coming across uh, Birgit Marga's kind of little pamphlet book on service design that uh, she had produced while teaching at Cologne International School of Design. I was looking for service design. I was doing a lot of work in sustainable design and um, the work at that time, this was the early 2000s, really 2000, 2001, 2003, uh, a lot of the work at that time was trying to think about how do you dematerialize society? How do you reduce materials intensity? How do you make sure our lifestyles are uh, less heavy with less churn? And so a lot of people were talking about how, how you do serviceization, how you shift to service economies. Um, and as someone speaking from design, I was interested in design-based change towards those service economies in the name of sustainability. But service design wasn't really a thing at that time, and then I, or, or not a thing I was aware of. And then I remember coming across Birgit's uh, booklet and thinking, ah, it, it is a thing. It's it's a thing that people are starting to to think and talk about. Mm. I went to a John Thacker conference in two thousand and three, a Doors of Perception event in um, Delhi, in India, and I met um, the two people who were setting up Live Work in the United Kingdom. Mm. And they said, oh, yeah, yeah, no service design. They'd come out of the Interaction Institute in Ivrea and they were now founding a service design firm. So they and Engine were beginning to create UK-based service design. So then I thought, oh, this really is a thing now. And that's two decades ago. Yeah, Can you imagine? Ago. Yeah. You know, that's why this beard is gray now. <laughs> so, it's a long time ago. Thanks. Thanks for sharing. That's always nice to get a little bit of uh, origin story. Um, Cameron, to get to know you as a person next to the professional a little bit better, we've got five questions for you to reply to as quickly and briefly as possible. Um, are you ready? Yep. All right. Finish the sentence. The thing that always makes me smile is... Uh, oddly, stand-up comedy. I... I... I am a bit of an addict for a good stand-up comic, uh, Stuart mm. Lee in particular, with these kind of anti-capitalist rants. Uh, a lot of them get cancelled, I think, quite deservedly. Um, so it's always a bit of a worry. Um, but I find, in a weird way, it's it's sort of anthropology. It's, it's observation. Um, and I do think that you can learn a lot about the nature of social relations between people. So it's not only just like actually making me laugh, but I actually find it um, always quite quite intriguing and, and, and worth considering as a kind of research source. I think Edward de Bono mentioned that humor is one of the most important or an impo important ingredient in creativity. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, there, there, there has to be, and that enjoyment is not just uh, visceral. Um, it, it's the enjoyment of discovering new things. It's the enjoyment of suddenly seeing a connection that was playful, and sometimes that connection makes you laugh, and then sometimes that connection is a piece of insight, uh, which is the moment at which you go, aha. So, um, yeah, but I do, I do find myself oddly distracted by stand-up comedy, I have to say. All right. Uh, question number two. Let's see if we can uh, <laughs> pick up <laughs> <Briefly>. the pace. <laughs> the most important quality in a friend is? Reliability. Uh, just always being there. I think it's it's very important that n no matter their circumstances or your circumstances, um, they they are present and they show up and they they give time. So um, and I think we look for that reliability in things and not only in people, uh, and it's not always there. All right, the book that has impacted my life is uh, Elaine Scarry's *The Body in Pain*. Elaine Scarry is an English literary professor. I call her a kind of philosopher of literature. The final chapter in the book is about um, a kind of philosophy of why we make things, artifact creation, and the way it's about seeing pain in other people but wanting that pain to be gone. And the frustration of not being able to do anything to make it uh, sort of drives us into creating artifacts that can help. And it's just a really beautiful book. It's a, a life-changing book. Fascinating. Um, well, added to the show notes for sure. Um, question number four is... What is your hidden talent? My hidden talent is pissing people off. 
Um, I, I, I don't think I'm doing it, but I am definitely doing it. So I have a capacity to mm-hmm. unintentionally alienate people. And it's very problematic because it, it really gets in the way of the sorts of things that I'm trying to convince them to do. So it's Please not leave really a, comment. a skill. <laughs> yeah, If you've been pissed off by our conversation today. You'll, you'll get a, a torrent. I'm sorry. Uh, to everyone I'm pissed off, I'm very sorry. I promise you it's not intentional. All right. And the fifth and final question, Cameron, is the world, our world needs more Service designers is a really cliched answer, but I think people who understand social relations and understand ways of creating social relations between people, which is how I define service design, I think we need that. Right now, there are a lot of people who've given up on sociality, on institutions, on organizations. We, we need people who understand how to create new types of social relations. Right. Creating new types of social relationships. Cameron, when I was reading through the notes you shared with me, um prior to our chat now the thing that came up for me was that we need to think and act in service design beyond just services can you explain that a little bit more i think if you just said to somebody what is the service section of the economy what are service jobs they have a very particular understanding of what that is and i think a lot of service designers uh their bread and butter is designing that type of service. Um, as I said just then, I think services can better be understood as ways in which strangers collaborate, ways in which people who don't know each other are helped to help each other. Um, and it's not just the provision of service to a customer, but it's the customer participating in the creation of, of value between two people. Uh, and I think service designers have a lot to bring to how our societies do that stranger collaboration, whether it's a, a cooperative, uh, whether it's a formal organization or an informal organization, whether it's government, um, whether it's ways in which uh, people can be welcoming of immigrants and difference, ways in which people can begin to change their lifestyles, uh, ways in which people can actually begin to modify their, the values that they, they think they live by. Um, and I think that is actually what service designers can service design, can sculpt, can help create. And uh, how would you describe the current notion or perspective on service design? Apparently, we're not there yet where you imagine and hope, wish we would be. So where are we today? I think we are too much of a service industry. I think we wait for clients to come with problems that we solve. I think we are not entrepreneurial enough. I think we are competitive agencies who are trying to win work uh, and then do one-off projects, hopefully get the client back again. But um, I just cannot see enough collaboration. I cannot see enough alliances. I cannot see enough people creating opportunities for change and creating opportunities for service designing and not only for themselves, but for others. So I think we need to start to become much more of a collective force for moving societies toward more equitable and sustainable futures uh, and much less people just waiting for the perfect client to walk through the door. Who is, um, who is we uh, when you say uh, we need to be a more collective force? Who do you foresee being that? Uh, so I'm referring to the community of practice that are designers, um, which would stretch from strategic designers uh, through to product designers and include service designers. I think part of my concern is that a lot of service design has been yoked into and under digital design, uh, and it's become a kind of subset of that. Um, and so, yeah, that we is an appeal to people to be more assertive about what difference service design can make and to begin to ally with other people who are committed to that project of creating new social relations, uh, fostering new opportunities for uh, people to begin to collaborate as strangers. Um, so I'm appealing to a we that I think could exist. Uh, it doesn't quite exist at the moment. It's often more in activist and not-for-profit space uh, than it is in agency-based service design. How would you imagine this to look like 
like in in the ideal scenario, if you could sort of shape and craft our world, our community, what would we have that we don't have right now? I think it would be something, this is a terrible analogy, but it's a, sort of a go-to. I think it would be something like um, Doctors Without Borders or Engineers Without Borders. Uh, and I don't mean it in the sense that the projects exist in the global south and these are opportunities for the global north to to suddenly do a small bit of ethical give back. I mean it merely in the sense that it's an alliance of people who use service design skills and expertise and insights to find opportunities for change and to begin to lead that change, um, who are not, as I said, waiting for clients to create the opportunities for them to do the work, but are actually going and initiating projects. So um, I am I would want an alliance of service designers who are committed to bringing about uh, these kinds of changes uh, in their own societies, across different societies, uh, not necessarily you know, in, in um, less privileged circumstances, but actually sort of deprivileging their own societies and, and committing to that. So it's halfway between a community of practice and a political organisation. Um, and it's definitely something that would have a, you know, a strong ethical mission. Yeah, you mentioned the word activist. Uh, I think that resonates with me. And uh, when you use words like alliance, that really strongly resonates with me. Um, yeah. And taking a short sidestep uh, from this, one of the things you uh, shared with me is that you feel that the service design community is vastly undereducated yes. i see you smiling uh, and i uh, it's a provocative uh statement so i would love to go into that can you share your thoughts so there's there's a kind of um just a very straight pragmatic reading of it which is that a large percentage of people who call themselves service designers or have service design as their job title do not have a design education um, and have at possibly only done a short course in a type of what I would call UX version of service design. And you mean uh, with edu formal education, like the I classical? Mean, formal yeah, yeah. yeah. This, yeah so no, if, you just, if you surveyed the population, you'd find that um, I think possibly even a majority have not actually done, a, let's say, a degree in mm -hmm. service design. If they have done a degree in service design, it's almost entirely postgraduate mm -hmm. degrees. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then, so you're now a smaller population. If you kind of took this and said, okay, well, this many have only done short courses and this many have actually had uh, formal training. Um, of those, half of them have probably pivoted from some other degree, marketing or, or, or business or um, uh, coming from anthropology. Uh, the number of people who are doing postgraduate service design but have done undergraduate design and are now service designers is a really small minority of uh, service designers out there. Now, that's not a good measure. I don't think um, it's the only one. So that's why I said that's the first pragmatic measure is just to say, I think service designers are undereducated formally in that way. But I think that's not necessarily the case. I think people who are self-taught, people who've done a short course, people who are well experienced, I mean, not that they, they are undereducated, not because they're lacking formal qualifications, but because I don't see a community of practice engaged in ongoing professional development in a really rich and critical way. I do not see service design being a community of practice that celebrates critique, that mm. celebrates uh, analysis of failure, that is wanting to learn and wanting to share. There are bits and pieces. People tell stories on podcasts. Uh, there's a conference, ServDes, and then the, the uh, ISDN conferences. And there are bits and pieces. So obviously there is some, but I think given what I think is the importance of service design, I just don't believe there's enough. There's, there needs to be a lot more, both formal and informal maturing of the practice. Have you? Do you have any guesses or assumptions why that could be? Because like we said at the start, it's not like it's a new community, it's a new field, but then again, we're into this over two decades so apparently something's going on yeah no no so this is, obviously this is the case that there is there's long a lot of demand and it arose you know as a profession because it was needed but the economy 
a kind of, you know, to use academic jargon, the neoliberal economy of the last uh, 40 years has only needed a very particular type of service. And so people have been designing services that delight customers and are more efficient for um, the provider. Um, on the edges, they're more inclusive. Uh, they are not what Shoshana Zuboff called the support economy. They are not uh, rich services in the main. They are not rich services delivered by people to people that enable people to, to develop whole new practices, uh, shift the nature of their businesses, reorient the, their lifestyles. Um, I think we could be seeing a lot more of that type of service design. And that requires, I think, a lot more sophistication as a service designer. And what kind of sophistication? I think you need to understand a lot about the nature of social interactions beyond just things like cognitive biases and uh, behavioral nudges. You need to understand different ways in which people have collaborated uh, over history, different cultures of collaboration. You need to understand a lot about cultural difference, different rituals, different roles people play. Uh, I think, you know, if you kind of just ran through the history of 20th century uh, anthropology and sociology, you'd find 20 or 30 concepts that I would hope every service designer knows. And yet I'm constantly frustrated that they don't. So even ones that are directly relevant, emotional labor, uh, ideas of uh, the presentation of the self from kind of Irving Goffman, uh, ideas of different types of um, everyday communism from Dave Graeber. Uh, I just think there, there is so many different models of social interactions that are beyond cognitive science um, that service designers need to be familiar with and drawing on for inspiration whenever they come across a project. Is it because these models or frameworks, um, I'm, I'm curious why they haven't been popularized yet as uh, like if they would be useful and helpful in the day-to-day -day practice of service design, if they would lead to better, I don't know, commercial results, people would have adopted them by now, I'm going to assume. They would. And so th I think that's exactly the issue that they, they don't look profitable according to a current mode of doing business, which is about uh, increasing price and lowering cost um, and generally trying to uh, move things into cheaper and cheaper labor. And the cheapest labor source is outsourcing to the customer themselves. So you get the customer to do half the service and you call it um, freedom of choice. You know, uh, you get to choose uh, and you put all the liability for the choice onto them. Um, and they have to pay the privilege of doing it. So, you know, at one point it was called time theft, that kind of unsourcing to your, to your customers. And definitely people have embraced the version of choice they get, but I think that's starting to be exhausted. I think that value proposition is exhausting. And I think the kind of push around chatbots and uh, artificial intelligence right now is, is the last effort to come up with the uh, high price, low cost version of service that is not actually paying skilled people to support customers. So, yes, we are moving into eroding services in that sense. And that is mainly driven, like you said, by a profit or a, rev yeah, a profit perspective, commercial perspective. That's as long as there are businesses, that's probably going to be the case um so uh, do we have the ability and if so how do we change that bottom up because we are not yet in the positions where we lead the organizations we're not yet calling the shots on the level necessary to change this what, what's your take on this um so i think two things the, the, the first is uh I am confident in the analysis that, that this is not a sustainable business strategy, that if you just look at uh, eroding trust and customer satisfaction, pe people are not feeling like they are getting what they deserve from this setup. And that frustration you can see bubbling everywhere from conspiracy theorists to doubting experts to hating banks and governments and uh, airlines and everybody. 
I just feel at the moment it's a really tricky situation in which if you actually realistically accepted how many people don't like the services they have to pay for because they have no choice, we should actually be very close to revolution, but, mm. but we're, we're not. So I'm very confident that the current business model in which the support economy that I'm talking about is not viable, and that's why service designers haven't had to educate themselves to, into a mature practice to lead that change. I'm pretty sure those conditions are changing now. They're, I think they're coming to the end. So I think it's important that service designers begin to, as they say in North America, where they play ice hockey, possibly in Scandinavia as well, you know, you've got to play to where the puck will be. You don't play to where the puck is now. I suppose it's a, a football analogy as well. Um, you need to move to the open space. And uh, it's a risk. And it's a risk in which people need to have alliances in which they support each other in trying to make those transitions and really pushing clients. So if clients are not yet prepared to realize that customers are dissatisfied with the chatbot version of their service, um, we, need, we, this smart set of service designers, need to begin to uh, refuse to do that work. And we need to critique that work publicly and we need to take some risks. We need to take some risks. Uh, I think you should be asking uh, service design academics to lead that because we are somewhat protected from the market and, and we're in a position to be critical. But I think uh, things are changing and people need to be pushed. It's not changing fast enough. Uh, and service designers can see it whenever they um, uh, have to compromise on a service design because it doesn't fit an existing business model, which is unsustainable. So I'm, I'm feeling like there are options. They're not easy options. They're political options. They're risks. Uh, I think a lot of us are in a very privileged position to be able to take risks. Whenever I say this, lots of people say, well, you know, junior designers can't possibly say no because they'll lose their job. And it's kind of like, I'm not talking to junior designers. I'm talking to design leads. I'm talking to principals of companies. Uh, service design agencies, I'm talking to the thought leaders in this space, and I'm talking to the, the educators who can provide some backup as well. I think it was Wayne Gretzky, by the way, who uh, came up with a hockey uh, puck <laughs> uh, story. If we dive into that a little bit more, um, I have the privilege to host a community, an alliance of uh, service design professionals who do work in-house inside organizations. They have the opportunity to shape the future of their organizations, if we would have a chat with you and sit down and think about, okay, so where is the puck heading to? And if I say to my boss, you know what, I don't think we should do this work, they will ask me for an alternative. So let's talk a little bit about what does the alternative look like? From my perspective, the alternative looks like a lot more people-based mid level experts doing what is called in social work casework that they they have people who they are responsible for helping make decisions so the example that i use is just recent experience i've had doing some work with banks around scamming so um, i presume in your country as well and around the world levels of scamming are just going through the roof um, they are being aided and abetted by artificial intelligence on both the analysis and delivery side and it's very clear that uh, banks, for example, who are already not well trusted, are falling behind in this. So people are, are experiencing a situation in which the model of it's all up to you, you do your research, you make a choice. If somebody comes to you with an investment opportunity that sounds too good, nevertheless, this is a rare opportunity, you should take it. And then you take it and lose your money. People are desperately looking for in financial services, trusted support. You can get that trusted support if you're high wealth. You can get a, a personal banker. You can get financial advisors. This is a, a really expensive service. Uh, everybody else gets nothing and just gets put into this risky situation. It's not dissimilar in health. It's not dissimilar in education. Where, where are you going to study service design? We give you, here's the website. It's all promotional material. You work it out. There, It's very difficult to get as a junior, a coach who can help you find the right course for you to do. Um, so we don't have good models of all these different versions of expert service that are somebody well-trained who has the time to talk to you and do case by case. It's a really expensive business model. 
So obviously people aren't going to be able to afford to pay for it up front. So it'll have to have some kind of um, uh, equity purchase or paying up over time or hopefully not the model of I'm being paid by somebody else to give you this advice and therefore I'm going to sell you what they're selling. That's how we got into this in the first place. So we need some other model of what this mid-range expert service is. And we have examples of it, you know, with things like social work, um, um, financial counselling, as opposed to financial advice. Um, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, in America, when you go to university, you're immediately assigned uh, an advisor. And those advisors give you personal advice about which subjects to take during your college degree. Um, and that happens. That's a whole profession in America. There is a profession of student advisors. They don't occur in my country. I'm not sure if they don't occur in yours. Um, but again, it's a particular type of service provision. And it's a very old knowledge-based version of the care economy. So that's what I'm sort of talking about very abstractly. I think I can find particular examples in energy services, in bank services. Um, that's what I think we need to be heading towards. Interesting. Uh, I can imagine that as we're listening to this and we're in the uh, peak of the AI hype cycle, one might stand up and say, you know what, all this knowledge, all this expertise is or very soon will be baked into things like AI. So we don't, like we should eliminate the human from the equation because of the biases, because of the like limited amount of knowledge a single person can contain. I'm sure you have some thoughts on this as well. I have I've no faith in artificial intelligence uh, whatsoever. Um, but I think just in terms of the, the, the service proposition, artificial intelligence is a pattern-based system with a generative capacity. So that means that it is always going to be synthesizing existing patterns and therefore proposing them to you uh, and your situation. Uh, we are nowhere near actual comprehension of individual contexts. Um, even today, if you were to ask a question of some generative uh, next word predicting service, um, you have to be a very skilled prompter to try and architect it. And in fact, you have to be so skilled in asking the question, you probably know what a good answer is. Uh, it's very difficult to be someone who generally doesn't know the answer and ask a question. Uh, and then get the correct answer. So it's just a long way from being able to actually understand personal circumstances, individual cases, or actually using biases productively. So, uh, you know, doctors will have a very particular bias towards certain types of therapy. And you understand that as you get to know your doctor and you know that the, sometimes they will say, well, look, the general feeling is that this drug does this, but I've I've known you for a while now and I've seen your way your body's reacted to other things. And I think we should stick out, stay away from that one. I think we should go with this one. I think we can use this combination. That is not something we are going to get from artificial intelligence, uh, despite fantasies about general artificial intelligence, uh, anytime soon. Uh, and I think never is actually the answer. I'm trying to imagine, like we live in a service economy, uh, service dominant logic says that everything is a service, even in your bicycle is a service. The, the examples that you're describing, I'm curious to which extent they are sort of the edge cases versus the commonality. Like do how, how prevalent are these expert case led services? Am I, uh, like, yeah. yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. It's a great question. And I have an odd answer, which is a lot of the work that I've been doing in a university context, which is therefore looking for progressive social change based uh, projects, has identified that often somebody who might have very particular technical skills ends up finding themselves in a quite complex social situation. So if you are the cable guy, who comes into a house to connect somebody's uh, internet up. You're one of the few people who crosses the threshold into a private dwelling. And we know that those people will often see uh, evidence of domestic violence or partner abuse or neglect or something else. 
So all of a sudden, you have this desire, I have this desire to make sure that everybody who crosses the threshold, who's invited into a house to do a technical service, also has a social work degree mm. uh, or understand something about service design and social relations and understands how to do referral at that point. It's not that they need to know it all. It's just that they need to know enough to recognise. Uh, and it's the same as I was saying with a bank. A bank just looks after your money and tries to get you to borrow money and tries to get you to spend money uh, as long as you can make enough money. But banks these days say they're also in the business of financial well-being. And if they're in the business of financial well-being, suddenly they need to be offering you tailored life advice. If they say you need to be saving a lot of money for your family and you happen to come from a, um, um, a sexual orientation in which that's not in the future, uh, I'm not sure the artificial intelligence is going to pick that up or how it's going to pick that up without some political worrying situation. Whereas, you know, the capacity for somebody to know you and have that kind of expertise, it's a low level social expertise and it's piggybacking on other types of service provision. So it's true that even a bicycle is a service uh, in a kind of service dominant logic way, but it's also true that your bicycle service maintainer can also see that you're in some financial trouble or see that you are wondering which service design subject to take at university and know that they can begin to refer in that way. So it's that type of expertise that I'm talking about. Yeah, and uh, correct me if uh, I'm wrong, but I think what what's at the heart of this is that organizations are sort of re-evaluating the place that they are taking up in our society. So where they used to could be pretty isolated and uh, pretty independent yeah. now and like you said financial well-being like that's a completely different objective for yeah. a bank versus yeah. keeping your money safe and yeah. when you shift your objectives and your goals and your mission as an organization it could be to save the planet i, I don't know what Patagonia's exact mission is, but you know they're they're selling clothes, but they're trying to achieve something else. When that happens, you have to adapt, and then you probably also have to think differently about what you're offering, yeah. something like that. I, I, I give you a quick example. I just told you I'm I'm in Sydney. There's a lot of wild weather this summer. There's a lot of flooding going on, so lots of people are now finding their insurance premiums going up. It's proving to be unaffordable. They're suddenly uninsured. I was talking to banks, and banks realize that they're not actually collecting the data to work out who has insurance on their houses. They check when you finance, and they don't check in the subsequent years. So all of a sudden, they were like, oh, my goodness, these people, they might get flooded, and then they can't repair their house because there's no insurance. And then we own, they owe us money for something that no longer exists. We need to call them up and have a conversation with them about insurance or moving. Like suddenly they're, they're, they, they live in an area that's been rezoned, a flood zone, uh, and we need to tell them they need to move. And the bank was sitting there saying, we don't know how to have that conversation. How, how do we possibly call up somebody and say, now, this is a strange conversation for your bank to be having, but no one else is having it with you. The local government's not having it with you. The federal government's not having it with you. The insurers aren't having it with you because they're just running away. So we're the last one left standing. We need to tell you, you need to move out of your house. Like, we need to help you to move now. So all of a sudden, you're a bank offering a mortgage, and you're now in the relocation services business because of climate change. And it was amazing to see them realize that uh, whatever value proposition they're working to at the moment, uh, that is literally going out the window. And it's not a matter of corporate social responsibility. It's not about looking good, looking green. It's not about any of that. It's, it's literally like uh, we do actually value our customers because they have an asset. And, and now we have to tell them to manage their asset. How do you have that conversation? They said, I said, well, you need service designers. They didn't have any local service designers. They only had digital designers. No one knew how to have this conversation. I love this example. And uh, we could sort of copy paste it on so many industries. Uh, you mentioned now we need service designers. Can you help us make that translation? So how do you go from, as a bank, we need to help our customers move because uh, 
they are an asset or they owe an asset to, hey, the realization, we need service design to actually get this done. I mean, in that particular case, uh, that lesson came from their just most committed branch managers and stories of how they handled the flood. So in that case, I was sitting in a room in head office as they were listening to somebody in a regional branch talking about lifting computers up onto desks so that the flood didn't destroy the IT and wrapping up um, uh, safety deposit boxes so that somebody's heirloomed items from their their family history weren't going to go mouldy. And when they saw that somebody was proactively doing the service, there was nothing in their job description. There was no, It never said in their job description, oh, and by the way, when a flood comes, move the computers and bag the, the safety deposit boxes. And it was at that point that they thought, oh, actually, we could help these people. We could design a guide. We could have tools. We could have training sessions. We could have internal learning on how to begin to do this. And that's what we think of as service design. We train our frontline service workers to be aware of financial abuse when somebody comes with somebody else and they have a disability and the carer is there and the carer takes the money. So they do this training and it's called service. And all of a sudden, they was, that was the moment in which they were like, right, okay, so we actually need to design people, training, resources, touch points. We need to think about how to actually help people do this. So it, it suddenly... Because they saw their own service workers doing it, they saw it as service and they saw it as a service that can be designed. And I'm going to assume that the relationship or the role of frontline workers will also be completely different. So they're already working in a service industry, but I don't, I'm not sure if they all have a service mindset. No, in, in that case, though, you what, what caused the difference was the people in the head office seeing frontline service workers offering so much more service than was being asked of them by their official job description. And it kind of shamed them. It shamed them to think, we, we deliberately didn't tell you to do this because we'd have to pay you so much more if you did do all this. Hmm. But they were doing it anyway because they love their local community and it's an emergency and everybody pulls together. But it, it made a huge difference for them to see absolutely that frontline service workers do so much value creation that is just not evident to the people who are supposedly designing the value propositions of the bank. In this new form of relationship between service designers or service design professionals and people delivering the actual service, how do we, if like we, when we don't have a crisis or we, uh, it's not being asked for, what are ways we who are listening to this conversation could accelerate the adoption of this way of being, working, thinking? Uh, so, um, I mean, the, the one thing is just to make sure you're doing frontline observations, not of customers, but of service workers that you shadow service workers uh, and you see all that service that they are already doing in an undesigned way. And the design job is just simply to make it easier for them. And then to make the other half of the design job is communicating it back to head office so that it gets valued. Uh, I think the other is, um, is, is to do rich scenario, living lab type work. It's, it's, we have a tradition of speculative critical design I'm very critical of it because it tends to be a kind of play thing. It tends to be an aesthetic object. It tends to be a bunch of bad jokes by very privileged people about apocalyptic futures. It's now necessary that we do very rich simulation of emergencies in the same way that every airline does with every airline steward uh, who is hired, um, you know, being woken up at all hours to go, and th go through the emergency uh, routines on a plane until it's automatic. That's what you need to be doing with a bank about a flood. That's what you need to be doing with a real estate agent about a fire. That's what you need to be doing with a, um, uh, an in installer of internet about uh, um, physical abuse in partners. Um, you need to be running those scenarios and, and really helping people understand how they're going to respond in that situation. So it, it's like an applied theater job uh, at an enormous scale. 
to anticipate um, the kind of conditions we're going to be living in in the coming coming decades. Interesting. Fascinating. I can totally see the importance of this. And I'm seeing hopeful examples of organizations moving this way already. And like you said, it takes courage to adopt this way of being, working, earning your money, uh, accepting that you on the short term might earn less in the long term. You'll still be <laughs> alive as an organization. I think yeah. that's what at stake. Um, I mean, sorry, Mark, another, just to interrupt. I mean, another way to think about this, this is research, and this is particularly university-partnered research. So every service design agency should be having a really significant chunk of their people and time working with universities on coming scenarios, not just, again, waiting for clients, but investing in professional development uh, in maturing their practice by working with the people who have the capacity to think about these things uh, to think about where the puck will be, uh, even if it's calamitous, and to create rich situations in which people can learn from it. So um, I do wish that many more service design firms of every size um, had formal partnerships and that, uh, you know, the way to resource it is government funding for research with partner with uh, services. So there is, a, there is a possibility there. It's more possible in the EU than it is uh, where I am. Um, I'm not sure how possible it is in the US, though a lot of universities have large endowments, so you would have thought it was possible. But I just think there should be uh, a lot richer partnership between service design and service design research. It, it really makes me think if I go back to my personal situation right now and the community of service design professionals that I have the privilege to be part of, like this is starting to create critical mass. Uh, I'm starting to feel that you don't need a thousand people to start a movement, like 50, 100 uh, yep. people can already make a huge impact and lead by example. Um, yeah, so I haven't considered partnering with universities or uh, education, but that might be a, a great avenue to explore. And I feel that the people, members of this community of the circle are, are eager for this knowledge. They like they joined this community, this alliance to to uh, their practice to push uh, the entire field forward. Yeah. Excellent. And and look, if your first part of call is listening to this podcast and and not being pissed off, as I said at the beginning, but actually thinking, okay, maybe. Uh, I am really happy to chat to anybody about this. Um, it's not a consultancy. I don't charge any money. I, I get paid by my university to profess. That's the job of a professor. So I'm I'm here to talk to people about these possibilities because uh, it's where I think our society is both going and needs to go. So if anybody wants to start to flesh out what this might look like, um, I'm happy to help them flesh it out. I don't necessarily have to be the researcher on it. You can find local partners, but I'm really happy to chat to people about this. Uh, thank you for inspiring me. This already gets my mind buzzing on uh, this morning uh, where we are recording this. If you could leave us with um, one practical takeaway, what do you hope people, if there's one thing listening to this conversation, what do you hope we take away from it? It's a strange thing. I want people to recognize just some of the the own frustrations they have. I think if you're a professional service designer, you tend to think, I know how to do things. I know how to work out uh, banks. I know how to work out insurance. I know how to work out uh, renewable energy. And even then, even if, if you're that type of person, you will still have these moments at which you think, oh, this is, this is a bit beyond me. This is a bit risky. You've made mistakes in, in some of the decisions you've made. I want you to remember those moments and not just think, mm, that's embarrassing. I won't tell anyone but actually admit that it would be great if there was a service that could help you, even you, you in your professional privilege. So just remember those moments. You'll see them in customers. You'll see them in companies. You'll see them in communities. But remember them in yourself and think we could have a support economy. We could have a situation in which businesses exist, governments exist, agencies exist to, to help people make decisions uh, and to make the right decision for them and not to have to outsource that to their own limited knowledge or some bad chatbot. So I want people to just remember that frustration, which I'm hoping 
I certainly have, and I think everybody else has. So just remember that next time you're designing and don't just design a service that's cheap and delightful, design one that's actually moving towards support. You mentioned um, that you're open to connecting. So uh, when listeners wanna reach out or learn more about your work, what are some good ways to do that? I am only on uh, the platform I don't enjoy, LinkedIn. I have uh, deserted uh, where I used to piss a lot of people off on Twitter because it's now run by somebody who really pisses me off. So um, I'm only on LinkedIn. Um, just hit me up there. I'm, I'm on there too much still, uh, and, and I'll always follow up. So, yeah, just, just go there. We'll make sure to add those links there. Um, you have some great articles uh, published. Or I think it's Medium, right, where you publish your articles. Half on Medium, half on LinkedIn. I'm trying to find. I'm wondering if I should stick it on a something else. I don't Ke know. CameronTonkinWise.com might still be available. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> um, Cameron, thanks uh, for coming on, sharing and pushing the boundaries and uh, the pushing the bar, setting the bar higher for the work that we do, uh, saying no more often and offering a more interesting and helpful alternative to the work that we do. So... I've really enjoyed it. So uh, thanks, thanks again for coming on. It's a real privilege, Mark. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm, I'm excited to uh, to have been number one nine eight. It was a real, uh, it's, yeah, been a bit of an aspiration to kind of get here. And so thank you so much. Thanks, thanks again. Okay. Cameron knows how to shake things up and do it from a place of gratitude and optimism. What I'll remember from our conversation is that we should not wait for permission to build better services. Don't expect anyone to ask you to do so. You have the power and the responsibility to push your organization forward. So be the source that shines a light on a brighter future. If you've enjoyed today's conversation, you can do me a big favor. Click the like button on this video if you haven't done so already. Not for the YouTube algorithm, but for me to let me know whether or not we're on the right track by discussing topics like this. Finally, before we part ways, please take a moment to reflect and celebrate that by joining us today, you've directed your attention towards learning and growing as a professional. So from everyone who you are going to impact through your work, thank you for taking the time and making the commitment. My name is Mark Fontaine, and I look forward to having you with us again for a new conversation on the Service Design Show. Take care and see you soon.